This is Tell Me What to Read, the podcast from booktopia.com.au. I'm Mark Harding, and today I am very happy to be bringing you two conversations with two very different authors. First, best-selling Australian novelist Fiona McIntosh talks about her new book, The Spy's Wife, with Ben Hunter. And then I'm very excited to bring you my interview with Shane Jenak, a.k.a. Courtney Act, about his memoir, Courtney Act. Check the show notes for timestamps for both of these conversations. Now over to Ben for his chat with Fiona McIntosh. Fiona McIntosh, welcome to the Booktopia podcast. It's great to be back. Thank you. Thank you for doing this with me over Zoom. Um, the first thing I have to ask is uh, what on earth have the last few months been like for you? Because I know you, Fiona, of, of all the authors, are you have to be the most intrepid. You, you always travel to the places you write about. Um, so, so how have you, you managed the past umpteen months? Well, I've had to put into practice what I claim is one of my superhero powers, which is to compartmentalize. Um, people always ask me, how do you work on so many different projects at once? And I, I always say, well, I'm pretty good at putting that aside and then just getting on with this. I, I'm, I've actually developed it into quite a skill. So I've had to practice that and compartmentalize my frustration at not being mm. able to travel. Um, it's it's not so much, you know, the, the glamour of the travel. It's that I feel very cut off from all my main subject matter and my locations. And it's, um, yeah, it, it's a, apart from being frustrating, it's just a bit unnerving because I have to start thinking, well, now I, I need to write Australian-based books, which is super scary for me. I've never tried to do that before. I've never thought of myself as um, being capable of doing it. I think people who are born and raised in Australia have it in their DNA and write it very well. So I've always felt I would be an imposter, an imposter. Um, but I had to get past that as well. You know, I've, I've got to, because I think we're all, certainly I'm trapped for a little bit longer um, than just yeah. this year. Um, you know, the likelihood of traveling next year is uh, optimistic. So I will try mm. by the second half of next year to be getting abroad again. But until then, here we are. Oh, well, I'm, I'm excited to see what we read from you next. But um, I must say congratulations on this new novel, The Spy's Wife. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's a... Uh, you know, I was writing it into the times of COVID. So I'd already done the research. I'd, I'd scuttled in back from Berlin and Munich and Stuttgart um, in March 2020. So they were closing the doors behind my bottom, literally pushing me in, you know, saying, get in before um, you're locked out sort of thing. And I made it in just in time. So normally um, I do three trips per book because I like to research in layers. Um, I won't go into the technicality of why I do it that way, but I do tend to research in layers. But I got wind of what was happening in the world and we didn't know, had no idea how serious it was going to be, but I took the precaution of trying to gather up a lot more than I normally would. So um, yeah, I had to sit down and start writing this book into all this fear and um, sort of fright that we had that was going on in the world. March 2020, we had no idea what this was all really going to turn into. Mm. And so I decided that although I was writing a book about, you know, I like to write into the two world wars, I decided to avoid it. And so I set this story deliberately in summer when I tend to write into winter, I deliberately set it into summer. So everybody would be in summer frocks and the sun would be out and, um, you know, it would have that summery, feel-good vibe. 1936, on the eve of the Berlin Olympics, I wanted it to be a sort of a happy time uh, for the world, feeling, well, that war is behind us, the Great Depression, we're coming out of it. Everyone's feeling optimistic for the future. They don't know what's coming. The reader knows what is ahead. But I deliberately wrote yes. into a happy time because I think I needed to for, for where we were. 
And also, if I can just keep going, which is, um, sorry to uh, just blather on, but I deliberately kept the story quite cheerful um, in the sense of my editor said, this is quite a cheeky tale, Fiona. Um, your main right. character is quite cheeky in what she gets up to. And um, she said- She, she is it, brilliant, yeah. Yeah, she, and I didn't know she was going to be like this, but just the times and the whole, the whole way the world was going, I just let Evie go. And she began to become this rather, this free spirit from this very um, sleepy hollow where she comes from, a station master's daughter in a sort of branch line of North Yorkshire. I mean, you couldn't get more sleepy than that. And suddenly she's trying to change the course of politics, governments, potential war. She's a fish out of water. She's doing things she never should do. And then she straps on, if you don't mind, a sort of James Bond um, three quarters of the way through the book and does extraordinary things. So I loved her for it. I loved her daring. I loved her adventurous nature, which flew in the face of who she truly was. But maybe if yeah. you take a step, maybe she really is this person and just needed to bust out, you know. So um, it does feel like a 1950s sort of, I don't know, romp, a sort of a Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn kind of story, doesn't it? I mean, I don't know. It's it, There are moments of great suspense, but fun in there because she's quite the heroine, yeah. really. I was, I was describing it to my partner yesterday and, and I said, yeah, look, it, it, it is, it's, it's a story about uh, Germany in the 1930s. It is a, it's a dark place, but um, yes. there's, there's some, there's some light to it and there's, you, you 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 hit a balance right where where there's there's just enough thrill to pull you along but Absolutely. you have a um you really do you have a you have a character in Evie who is I love I love the way um the the English uh chap she gets uh, dragged in to speak to in London um yes <laughs> close to the front of the novel that they, they discover as a woman with a lot of pluck I love that. She really does exactly, have that. Exactly. But she's a woman with agency. It takes the reader by you surprise. Know? She's really yeah. um, driven, isn't she? And and she's driven through fear. I mean, that's what, uh, it's fear that's driving Evie, but she finds this level of courage and, and, as I say, daring, almost swashbuckling in the way she sort of just throws herself at what she finds herself having to contemplate. Um, and it's all or nothing. She's really boots in for, for what this is all about. But you're right. And, that, and I did want it to go to that dark place. I mean, Berlin in the early 30s, you couldn't have found a more liberal place. It's where all the people who were very different and artistic and creative and, um, you know, like to behave differently, they flocked to Berlin because of its liberal nature. And then by 1934, 35, it's become this just conservative sort of right wing and and very um, um what can i say it's it's very um it's it's putting people back into boxes and it's demanding women by the time evie gets there it's demanding that women dress a certain way and they have to wear german made clothes not french not parisian fashion but germ solid sensible german clothes and so it goes you know they're beginning to really um batten down the hatches on people um so it is a dark yeah, place this this is this is one of the things that um interests me in this story is, is reading the color you put into it uh it's it's the it's the mood of change at this mm. very specific it's, it's 1936 i'm yes um, it's is the specific time I'm, I'm yeah reading. it's specific um, <laughs> and you know we begin in yorkshire where you know as you say north yorkshire sleepy town but um yeah. the fear of the foreign has has crept all the way up into yorkshire uh mm. and then and then you know you take us beyond that obviously we go on um, glorious adventure um to germany via paris and the r rapid change that is sort of sweeping the culture um particularly when when evie finds herself uh, i'm gonna say a married woman <laughs> that's, that's, that's 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 something i can say because of the title um 
in Bavaria uh, in 1936, uh, it is it is the temperature is hot, right? And there's yeah. there's a lot of change going on, and and it's the small things, right? Fiona, mm. the the um, her husband uh, gets in trouble for uh, giving the Nazi salute in an improper manner. You know, he, it's not just that he didn't, it wasn't that he didn't do it, it's that he didn't do it to the correct letter. Yeah. And it's these small things that these, this kind of cascade of rules that's just sort of coming through. So uh, what can you tell the listener about that, that mood you try and capture, particularly in the city of Munich? And, and what can you say about the city of Munich? Well, firstly, about the city of Munich, I, I've always loved Bavaria. So I didn't want to write a cliche story of Nazi boots stomping around Berlin. You know, I just wanted to avoid that. And so I thought, where can I take this story? And Munich, I, I really like Bavaria. And I thought, well, let's take it into Bavaria. But what I didn't realize until I'd done the research um, was that Munich was Hitler's playground. This is, um, you know, where he went to relax. He had his own apartment there. Um, the, he did his work in Berlin and he wore his uniform in Berlin. But when he got to Munich, he got into civvies and he'd meet his, his friends or his colleagues more socially. You know, he'd party there. He'd relax there. He'd chill there. And I love that. And I know that I wasn't sure I was going to actually have Hitler in the story. He's in the prologue. But I thought, am I going to have him in the story? And my editor dared me. She said, I dare you to put him in. And I said, if he comes into the story, I'm not going to have him as that stereotype that we know him as. I want him to be off guard. And so um, there is this scene that I really loved writing of just a chance meeting with you know, the Fuhrer, relaxing. And it's very quick, but it's it's sort of such a puncture point in the story, I think. It's where all yes. the fear comes, it crystallizes into one. And it's it's Evie's moment when she starts to think, I I have to, I have to, I am going to beat this. Um, so you asked me what I could tell you about Munich. It, I mean, we're walking into a time where people are very happy. You know, they're enjoying their summer. They are feeling good about Germany. Germany is no longer burning its own money for fuel. Germany is beginning to feel um, it's got getting back its dignity. And who is giving it its dignity? Well, it's Adolf Hitler and his new party that is saying, no, we're not going to remain the beggars of Europe. We are going to climb back on top and we're going to do this. And our children are going to go do very well in school. We're going to put our military back on top again. We're going to have a, an air force. We don't care about the Treaty of Versailles. We are Germany. We are going to be great again. And so that is, as I was writing this, all the Trump stuff was happening and it didn't feel dissimilar. And I thought, my gosh, this is how it happened. You know, people were being charmed and being made to swell with pride in their own country. And that is what she's walking into. The Olympics are coming um, you know, and yes, there's he's a lot got of a plan talk of the Olympics in yes, Munich. Very um, much, you the know, Olympics the world and, is uh, and and uh, the upcoming uh, rally in rally. Nuremberg. Yeah. Oh. The, oh my gosh! I went there. I went to look at this place, and anyone who's been there, I, I'm sure anyone listening to this who has been there will nod and say it's chilling. It's really chilling. It's huge, and you imagine this little man standing on top of that enormous um, sort of stage that they built for him. And you can imagine all the Nazi flags and all the hundreds of thousands of troops in front of him as he begins to um, give this great oration. And I thought, can I bring a rally into it? And I, I just had too much story. I couldn't get to the rally, but I did the research for it. And, um, you know, it's extraordinary stuff. These people were being seduced, just seduced completely by the whole theatre of it. And that's what was happening. It was theatre was being put on for them. Um, so Evie is not, you know, because she's so down to earth, she's not taken in by any of this. And um, But she knows she has to toe the line because there are lives at stake here. And that's what she's trying to do. She's actually trying, she's fighting to protect two very important lives, but also her own. 
Um, and so she's prepared to take these most enormous risks under the noses. Yeah, it's a novel of anticipation, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's it's knowing the the darkness to come, and and we're on this world that's kind of teetering on the edge. Well, it's uh, only the and, reader and that hint. knows that, though. Um, you see, and I think that's mm. what makes it. The reader wants to sort of, you know, how we did yell at pantomimes when we were children. We'd say, "He's behind mm. you." You know, you want to say, "Don't do it." You know, the reader's thinking. In a four years, you're going to be in this situation, but there's nothing they they have. I mean, the Brits are beginning to feel unnerved by what's going on in in uh, Germany, but everyone say no, they no one would do it again. They won't do it again. No, 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 no. It it's not going to happen again. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, you hint at uh, the you know the stakes, the personal stakes for Evie, um, and and this is this is also something I have to ask is um, you never fail to do this with your novels. They um, you bring in um, a genuine romantic connection, and that that becomes central to um, a really big story, right? Um, and you also have splashes of glamour and luxury, uh, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, and and there's there's yeah, as I said, just just that right level of of thrill and chill, and then just enough um, just enough cliffhanger, just enough to get your teeth chattering a little bit. That historical intrigue, as as we've obviously covered, how <laughs> I just I try and imagine how you bring these elements together time and again. Uh, do you do you sort of sit in a kind of war room, uh, charting different things, and I'll have the twilly scarf here and Nazi boots hit the ground here? And how, <laughs> no, how do, I, I, wish. I can't imagine I, that there's a it, it, it's too it's too good to be a formula, right? It's there's something organic about it. Yeah, how do you no, do? It? There's no formula. There there is no formula. Although you've analysed my signatures. Um, for my storytelling very well. I would never set out to write a story that didn't have a romantic thread in it because I think as humans, we're always looking for a connection, you know, a rom a, and romance is important to us. Uh, and romance is the fun part of falling in love. It's the, it, it's, and romance doesn't have to be about falling in love either. It could be the era, it could be the fashion, it could be the food, it could be. So I try and have many romantic aspects and that's important to me. That's gonna be a core of my books. But I must have an adventure in my books. I, I cannot write something that stays in one room or you know, one sort of, I never write a small story about small lives. They might not be important lives on the world stage, but I do make it feel like it's a big story about these people. Um, and so uh, because I know that's my modus operandi, I, I don't plan it, but it just seems to back a brain is making sure that all those elements you mentioned are indeed occurring. I can't write a book without some form of suspense in it where you begin to worry a bit for the character um, or, will they make it who which of them will make it will both of them make it you know um will they pull through this so there's always that i'm always going to write tension into my stories adventure a bit of romance and then that bigger stage you know these landscapes um these countries that we romp across you know just that dropping into paris is just that lovely punctuation of joy before we move into that you know darker part of the story um, London, going down to, um, you know, into the Secret Service, that is very tense, that conversation. And they are, it's very cat and mouse, and they're sort of playing with her, sort of talking down to her because she's a woman, they're talking down to her. And she, and he throws it right back at them. I love the way she sort of traps them into their own cleverness, if you know what I mean. Um, mm. So, yeah, I mean, these are, I don't plan it, I really don't, but I do have two years, because I don't plan my stories, I don't really know what's going to happen, but I think the percolation process um, is going on. So right now, I've delivered the next book for 2022. So my editor has that book, and we're, we're beginning to edit it. But my mind is now already percolating the story for 2023. I know what it's going to be, I know who my main characters are, 
but I'm not, they're over there. I'm not looking at them. I'm not giving them attention, but they are beginning to walk towards me. And I think that's back of brain saying, okay, so we're going to need to do this, but I'm not aware of that. So I don't know if that helps anyone out there to understand how it is that I do it, but I definitely do not plan a thing, not a thing. Um, in fact, yeah, even when it's, it's too I, good to be planned. I, yeah, I can't. I mean, I, I, if I tried to plan, I'd stay like in one track, I think. Whereas the, the yeah. thing about the spy's wife is there are surprises all around. I mean, meeting the, 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 the Porsche family and all, you know, just surprise after surprise. I mean, I wasn't, I didn't know that was coming. It just walked into the pages and I thought, oh my gosh, this is what I'm going to do. You know, we're going to do this. So yeah, I like the surprise myself. It keeps, it keeps the writing interesting for me as well. Thank you very much for taking some time to discuss this one. It's, it, it's, it's certainly a lot to unpack and it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a juicy novel. It really it is. is. Uh, I won't get you to hint too much about what to expect from the next one or, or one to follow that. Um, but I will finish by asking this question. When you do get given the privilege of travel once again, what is the first destination on your checklist? Russia. Russia. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Say no well, more. Well, I've got, I had a story for a book. Um, and we were very excited about it. Um, and it's huge. It's the most ambitious book I've ever sort of undertaken to write. And we'd even contracted it. We were all very excited. And then the world toppled into COVID. And I had to just set that whole idea aside and think, it will wait for me. So um, I'm busting to get back there. But of course, there are other places, of course, I want to get to London. Um, because all my stories sort of wax and wane into and out of London at some point. So I've got to get back to London. Um, I've, got to, I've got to get out of Australia. Yes, I have to write the sort of stories that I love to write. However, I have written an all Australian story for next year. And it's, um, I've never been more challenged in my life. It took, it took every ounce of my storytelling and, you know, 21 years experience at the keyboard to actually bring this story um, and, and deliver it to my editor. And I've never been more nervous. I mean, I was all but rocking in a corner waiting to hear back. And, you know, of course she's come back and said, what, this is brilliant, we love this story. So she's very excited and that's, you know, the relief is like a drug. So um, now we're just going to spend the next 10 months making it the best version of that book we can make it. Um, but it was very challenging. Because as I say, I, I have imposter syndrome sort of thing. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm thrilled about it because it's, it's looking at areas I've never touched before. I mean, in, in the, mot the, the motif and the, the sort of characters, the very Australian characters, I've never, you know, they're not that sort of um, posh English. They're, they're very much more down to earth characters. So it's, it's been a challenge. Loved it. Of course, I'm writing crime as well. That rolls on. Um, yes. So busy, busy, busy. Very much to look forward to. Fiona McIntosh, thank you for being on the Booktopia podcast. Always a pleasure. See you next year. The Spy's Wife is published by Penguin Random House and you can get it now from booktopia.com.au. Now my conversation is Shane Jack. Hello, Booktopians. I am absolutely thrilled to be here with a super special guest. Hello to Shane Jenick, a.k.a. Courtney Act. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, we're going to be chatting about your new book, your memoir, uh, Caught in the Act. Uh, but before we this, do... This one uh, here? I, that one right there. Perfect. <laughs> Which you can order right now at booktopia.com.au. Um, but before we, we get into the questions, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples watching today. So, how long have you been planning to write a memoir, and why was now the time for you to do it? Oh, um, I think the first time I seriously started thinking about writing a memoir was um, after I 
came out of the Celebrity Big Brother house in 2000 and I think it was 2018. Um, I got approached by a few different publishers and came back to Australia and and um, and sort of started thinking about it seriously and wrote some like, uh, I don't know what the right word is, like demo chapters and things. Uh, and then we met Lex um, at Pantera and I just fell in love with her and knew that if I was going to write a book that I wanted it to be with Lex because she just, she really like got what, I wanted the book to be. A few of the people we spoke to, I think, saw it as a bit more of a like celebrity pulp nonfiction, if that's a thing. Um, and I, I grew up reading different memoirs of people like Jenny Boylan and Kate Bornstein and Chaz Bono and Janet Mock, and I found those books to be so inspiring because there were such detailed journeys about those people's experiences with gender and sexuality and identity and all that sort of stuff. And I wanted to write, I guess, my version of that for this sort of new new, new world that we're living in. Um, and so I officially started writing the book on the first day of lockdown, which was March 17, 2020. Um, I landed in Los Angeles for work, which I knew had been cancelled, but I just assumed that this little, you know, pandemic thing would be a brief blip. Um, and that I'd be spending the summer in LA writing my book and working and everything like that, but everything ground to a halt, obviously. And, um, and I just spent the next, oh gosh, I'd say I spent the next solid March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, the next 10 months solidly isolated and uh, just writing every single day. You start off by talking about your childhood experiences in Brisbane. And while you were growing up in a loving and supportive family, there was still a struggle with identity due to lots of external forces. Um, what was it like to revisit this time in your life when writing the book? It was really good therapy. It was like, you know, you've heard the term like childhood regression therapy and things like that. Um, it felt like deep, like you go to a therapist for an hour, maybe once a week. I was waking up every morning and focusing on writing about my childhood and my life in extreme detail and not just explaining situations to somebody sitting on a couch, but actually thinking about um, what the house looked like, what the room looked like, what was the chair that I was sitting on, what was mum wearing, what was dad wearing, all those really um, visceral details uh immerse you so deeply in the memory that you process those sorts of childhood memories with your adult mind in a way that I found really healthy um I don't know any other way that you would have the opportunity to process your childhood in so much detail and I just see there's such value in storytelling not just for the people listening but for the person writing the story you also, um, you, you had a love of performing when you were a child, nurtured through your experience with the, the fame group, which meant you were able to go out and perform and connect with people who encouraged your love of performance and accepted that. How important do you think that community was to you in those early years? Yeah, fame was so important. It's so fascinating, right? Because I had a mum and dad who supported me. I had fame, which was this weekly place where I would go and be able to be myself and celebrate singing and dancing and acting and just you know, freedom of identity and freedom of this, the ideals of the outside world, if you will. Um, yet still, I struggled so much with my identity. And I just think I have such compassion for people who don't have supportive parents or supportive, you know, places like fame to go. I think, gosh, the, 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 the struggles that people overcome to be functioning humans in the world is is I mean I know how challenging I found it and I was so privileged in um, everything that I had and mine was just sort of from the societal ideas of what a boy was supposed to be essentially um, and so yeah going to fame was such a wonderful opportunity to express myself there was no confines of like oh this is how a boy should act or this is how a girl should act or you should act differently it was just a place where you got to go and sing and dance and and have a good time. And it was it was a real sanctuary for me uh, as a kid. 
Yeah, I think it's really interesting what, what you touch on there. And, and I think that um, something that comes through the book is how relatable that story is, that even though you might have grown up with progressive parents or, or in a context where you kind of had safety, it is still a struggle. Um, you know, you, you talk about how difficult it was for you to come out to your own parents when the time came when you were uh, 18 years old. Can you talk a little bit about how that conversation went? Yeah, I think because... It was a struggle because we never had the language or the conversations that had existed in the world outside. And, and mum and dad have read the book and sort of said, God, why didn't, why didn't you tell us? We didn't know any of this. And I was like, I didn't know any of this at the time. I was just a kid, like, stabbing around in the dark trying to work out what it meant to be a boy or what it meant to be feminine or what it meant to be queer and all of these things that I had no language or context for because they're never taught in school. You don't you didn't see them on the television. And, and even now, you know, I would struggle to come up with uh, TV shows where you see healthy examples of two men in love or two women in love. Um, there's definitely more queer representation in the media, but there's still not, you know, many examples of different types of stories. There's still a limited bandwidth of stories of, of queer people being told in, in the media. Um, and so when it came time to come out to mum and dad, I was really confronted with um, the struggles of other young queer people that I'd heard living in Sydney. And I was really afraid that I was going to face rejection. Um, and uh, when I did tell mum and dad that I liked boys, they were pretty like cool with it all um but it's so funny because I had so, all of that build up and I think just in general um when I was writing the book I wrote about my first kiss with the boy uh, at Stonewall on the second level by the DJ booth and when I was writing that what was a really happy lovely story about my first sort of physical contact with another male for sexual physical contact with another male, um, I just burst out crying and I, I, it was like such a healing moment and I realised that although that was an exciting moment, everything that had come before, all of the repression and all of the uncertainty about my own identity that led up to that moment was, was sort of changed in that instant and I had never really processed that. I just kissed this boy at Stonewall and gone on with my life but going back and revisiting it as an adult I just was like, oh, gosh, that, that, that 18-year-old kid that was, um, like, going out on a limb and crossing, crossing the threshold of what, you know, you were supposed to do. Obviously, these days it's a lot different, but in the year 2000, um, it was pretty, it was still a pretty taboo subject in the world at large. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was wonderful when I... Um, was able to revisit all those stories in writing the book and then also just thinking about my own parents and how they accepted my coming out and, and, and then reflecting back how they had essentially always supported who I was, um, but we just didn't have the language or the context to understand what that really meant in suburban Brisbane in the 80s and 90s. Mm. And I think that comes through in another anecdote that you've got from those early, early days in, in Sydney where you were stopped from having an unsafe sexual experience by, by somebody. And, and what came out from that story is that you didn't really understand what HIV was at the time. Do you think that um, things have changed enough since then for young queer people who are just starting to explore their identities? Look, I hope so. I think that the narrative and the conversation around sexually transmitted infections and HIV in particular has changed so much since the year 2000. In 2021, um, it's possible for people who are HIV positive to be on medication. That uh, means that they're undetectable and means that they can't transmit HIV to other people. There's also other tools uh, for people who are HIV negative to take um antiretrovirals each day which will prevent them from contracting HIV there's also things you can take if you think you've been exposed to HIV that'll stop you contracting it within you know 72 hours of exposure so there's lots of tools in the belt available now and that's different but I wonder if 18 year olds moving to the big city 
know about all of that. And I guess that's why these sorts of conversations are important. And I think that's really why those sorts of conversations um, in schools and when, when, when young people are becoming sexually active is when those conversations, conversations should start to be had. And I know there's a lot of resistance to that quite often. And people say, oh, that should be the parents. It should be the responsibility of the parents. And I'm like, honey, I don't know what conversations your parents were having with you, but let me tell you, if you think it's the responsibility of the parents to have conversations about safer sex, those people with those ideas are not the people who should be having conversations about safer sex with their children. Um, (laughs) We need to be having open and frank and honest discussions about sex and sexuality and gender and identity. And this is nothing about, you know, the gay agenda or recruitment or any of these absurd sorts of ideas that you sometimes hear bandied about by extreme um, belief holders on the right. It's about explaining to all people, not just queer people, but all people, the different facets of identity and how masculinity can manifest in different ways, how femininity can manifest in different ways. And the idea that it's okay for girls to be masculine and boys to be feminine and It's okay to like people of the same gender or different genders and just having conversations about all of those ideas because ultimately those ideas don't um, create queer people. Queer people, just as straight people, are that way, you know, from, from the time that they're aware. It's more that having that information allows people to make more informed decisions and feel less shame about their own identities because if I'd grown up in a world that explained um, all of those ideas from a young age, I wouldn't be different. I wouldn't, my sexuality and gender wouldn't have manifested differently. It just would have been much easier. Um, And I probably wouldn't be writing this book about it all. So in a weird way, there's a silver lining for me. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So your early days in Sydney, you kind of had some forays uh, into the drag world and encountering some of the huge characters who were on the scene at the time. What was, can, can you paint a snapshot of what the, the drag scene was like in Sydney in the year 2000? Uh, I, I just remember it being so exciting. We didn't have social media. We didn't really have the internet as such. We didn't have reality television. We didn't have YouTube. We just had... Um, I think the only place you could get news and information was like the TV news or from the magazines, you know, at the, at at the Coles or Woolies checkout. Like that was the most immediate information you could get about a celebrity. We didn't know what Kim, Kim Kardashian didn't exist. She, I mean, she did, but not in a popular way. Uh, We didn't know, we didn't have these like insights, people's Instagram stories or anything like that. And so to be a young queer person in Sydney, um, the drag queens and the DJs and the bartenders and the door people were like the local celebrities and the drag queens were obviously the most colourful of all of those. And Sydney was reeling in a a post Priscilla Queen of the Desert world. The Albury Hotel was jam-packed seven nights a week with locals and backpackers and people like spilling out onto the street drinking schooners of Tui's new back when you could drink on the streets Um, and just the drag queens I was such strong characters um, that I guess in a way sort of harkened back to the Spice Girls um, for me because they were the they were they were very strong individual characters but they would perform in these group production shows um, and they all had wonderful names, Mogadonna, Wines Mongrel Bitch, Amelia Airhead, Chelsea Bunn, Portia Turbo, Mitzi McIntosh. Um, it was just you would go and watch the shows. Like on a Monday night, shows at 11, 12 and 1 at the Albury Hotel or at Ark or at the Midnight Shift and um, Annie's Bar and all of these places you could go and watch these really fun and entertaining shows. And I just looked at all of those drag queens with sort of, uh, an element of awe I loved I loved being on stage I loved being a performer and I loved the freedom that they had to express themselves through makeup and costume and wigs and songs and performance and just seemed like a really good time you, you talk about that that kind of moment that you're in there um, and it's obviously pre-drag race and um, the big campy costume style of drag 
is kind of what, what was prevalent. But then you contrast that with what people like Vanity were doing, where they were kind of starting to make it make it fashion. Is it fair to say that drag as an art form was already in the process of some kind of shift or change at that point? I think um, it's interesting because like, you know, there's obviously trends, I guess, with drag as there are with fashion and art. And Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, really influenced, I mean, the Sydney drag aesthetic influenced Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and then that in turn influenced sort of the mainstream idea of drag at the time, I guess in a similar way that you could say Drag Race has. Um, and then Vanity was the new girl who came in under the old guard and then but she was just, I just always remember she was like a supermodel. She was this, this beautiful um, and was, is, was a wonderful and is a wonderful lip sync artist. Um, and Vanity and Ashley Swift and I started performing at the Midnight Shift together in a show called Devastated on Friday nights upstairs. Um, and we sort of became the, um, we were called New Millennium Drag. and. Um, and that was sort of the the beginning of that change, I think, um, from a Priscilla style of drag to a more MTV era style of drag. And that was, it was funny because there was always like this rivalry between who were known as the Beige Brigade, the girls from the Albury who had their beige shoes and um, they all had beige shoes. They all had to have the exact same beige shoes. And we would wear like, black knee-high boots, which was scandalous at the time to be a drag queen who didn't wear beige shoes and like elbow length gloves and have the exact same earrings. There was all of these rules. Um, and yeah, we would contour our makeup with different shades of foundation and they would just use one shade of Krylon Pantic in W4 and that was it. That was their foundation colour. We would contour and highlight and do all of those things that are probably more known um, in drag art today. And um, yeah, it was it was funny, like having that rivalry between us and them and at things like the Diva Awards, the Sydney Drag Industry Variety Awards, there was always a bit of an us and them of the new millennium drag versus the beige brigade. Um, and it was just it was it was a fun and exciting time. And I, it was always a, a friendly rivalry, but there was always like a bit of that, like, you know, they thought they were better than us and we thought we were better than them. And I, in, in, a, in a strange way, I think that competition drove us all to be better. I like the, um, the story that you've got in there about, um, I can't remember the name of the product, but what everybody used to use for their eyebrows and mm. how you came back from LA with the 59 cent glue stick from Target. And you're like, this is how yeah. you do it. Yeah. 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 And we used to use Grimace eyebrow plastic. Um, different queens would use different wax products, but essentially they're all like a form of, eyebrow wax you would wax over your male brow so that you could draw on a higher brow but that product just always it was sticky and when you put eyeshadow on it would stick to it was always very hard and it would lift and you'd have to carry a powder puff around all night and you'd always be pushing in the corners of your brows because they would be lifting and yeah and then I I came back from LA in 2010 and I was like guys you can just use a glue stick like a Elmer's glue stick or a a Bok, 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 I think that's a brand, Bosch. Yeah. Goes on purple, dries clear glue stick to glue down your eyebrows. And to me, it was a superior process. Vanity, however, still does prefer the Grimmer's eyebrow plastic with <laughs> one coat of um, glue stick over the top to seal it. So it's a hybrid of both of those. <laughs> um, and while we're on the subject of drag, uh, you've seen obviously drag become this huge cultural force now with its own kind of household names and rock stars and again a lot of that is attributed to the drag race franchise but do you think that um that drag race was an engine that drove this or was the world just ready to mainstream drag anyway um look i think you can't underestimate the impact of drag race i think Drag Race gave a platform to a lot of really talented artists and I think it did it in a way that made it so accessible. Everybody loved it. And then from there, so many individuals from the show have really carved out amazing worlds for themselves. Um, you know, whether it's, I mean, from our season, Bianca and Adore have got amazing careers and 
people like Trixie and Katia and Bob the Drag Queen and Monet and Sasha Velour and, you know, there's franchises all around the world that have really spawned, created the platform for a lot of really talented artists and people to uh, showcase what they do and, and run with it from there. And I think that the world was evolving and I think that Drag Race was a part of that evolution. Um, I think season six came out in 2014 and that was the same year uh, as Laverne Cox on the cover of Time magazine as the transgender tipping point. There was um, all sorts of queer, and not, again, not to conflate drag race with trans identity, but there was a lot of queer gender visibility and, and sexuality visibility around that time. And it was really starting to catch fire and turn into what I have seen as being a real revolution over the last six or seven years when it comes to sexuality and gender identity and pop culture and the conversations we're willing to have and the the spaces that people are allowed to have at the tables. Um, it's just changed so significantly. And it's not just one person. It's not tokenistic anymore. There's a lot of space being created for a lot of different people. So throughout the book, you have lots of little interludes that you call Courtney facts. Um, mm -hmm. Always a fan of a pun, so that's that's great. <laughs> but it's almost like a, a live glossary throughout the throughout the book of terms and concepts around sexuality and gender identity, where you can kind of explain what what some of these things mean. At what point in the process of putting the book together did you decide to uh, add these in? Um, it was near the beginning, I think, just because as I was writing, I wanted what I was writing to be accessible to everyone, um, and I knew that a lot of the terminology, just terms like trans and cis and queer aren't maybe top everyday words for a lot of people who are reading the book. I didn't want to just speak to people in the inner circle of queer identity politics um, and even, even, you know, friends of mine who are professional, you know, critical thinking people, I, I spent my, you know, my life is very much um, saturated by identity politics and, and gender and sexuality and identity. But, you know, everyday people living everyday lives, even if they're woke, may not be aware of all of these terms and how they intersect. And I just wanted to include my take on what all of those ideas were. Some of them are, some of the Courtney facts are, yeah, some sort of technical glossaries and others are about, you know, how to glue down an eyebrow. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, yeah, keep the definitions with as little assumption as possible. I wanted to really explain the context of some of those so we were all, as it were, reading from the same page. Um, in terms of your own gender identity, uh, you talk about, again, the power of language in that and how your struggle kind of ended when you found the words to describe and, and understand what um, is meant by being gender fluid, which I hope is not a spoiler for the book. Um, but um, what has that understanding meant for you? For me, it's, it's funny to think about now because it seems so obvious and I almost feel daft for having ever thought differently, but I guess that's an example of how confusing the binary, um, the binary like offering of the world is, like the idea that there's a man and that there's a woman and that there's gay and that there's straight and the idea that boys wear blue and girls wear pink. Um, even though I, my career was a drag queen, I still was really compartmentalised in the ideas of what was okay for a boy or what is a real man. Um, and I guess all of those, what we maybe popularly refer to as toxically masculine sort of ideas about what someone who is born with a penis should act like and feel like and think like. Um, and so in 2015-ish, um, the, the idea that 
gender fluidity was a thing, that it was okay for boys to be feminine and girls to be masculine was such a liberating concept for me. Again, it seems so obvious now. Like, I'm like, yeah, of course boys can act and feel and think in different ways, in in ways that are both feminine and masculine or just feminine or just masculine. Um, But at the time that label was so intrinsic so important to my intrinsic understanding of who I am that it really liberated me from what had been a lifetime of struggle about my gender identity um now like I don't wander around thinking like I'm gender fluid I'm just like oh gender is fluid um I express my gender however I like like I mean I don't think there's anything particularly radical about this top but the me of 2000 and 13 would have never been caught dead wearing a pink shirt because I thought that pink was a girl's like, was that I mean also like the world has changed its opinion on pink I mean these days you know I'll often say to a friend oh I saw his nail polish and that's how I knew he was straight you know there's a there's a there's a whole new world out there um but I I really found comfort in the label gender fluid and just this very very simple idea that however I expressed myself however I felt inside uh, that that was correct regardless of whether I was born with a penis or not which I was you also talk about <laughs> you also talk about um using Courtney to kind of explore or, or to have the, the permission to kind of exploit your feminine side um, early on. Uh, what does Courtney actually mean to you? Because it seems as somebody who's who's a fan and, and has watched your career, uh, if, you know, a lot of drag queens have a character that they play when they're in drag, whereas you and Courtney seem to be very, very close. Do you view her as somebody separate or is she just you wearing, wearing girl clothes? Yeah, it's interesting because I think about Um, say someone like my friend Willem who has the same name whether they're in drag or out of drag and in a way I almost wish that I didn't have a drag name because I mean whilst for the beginning of my career there were two separate boxes like I compartmentalized them in my head in order to make them make the idea of femininity socially acceptable because strangely drag was okay but being a feminine boy was not so even at that stage I was trying to be a boy when I was a boy and a girl when I was a girl and never the twain shall meet um and uh, now I think people see the visual being different they see someone who looks like a boy and someone who looks like a girl and they say oh this person's called Shane and this person's called Courtney and so there's a disassociation perhaps in other people's minds about who I am and they might see two different characters. But for me, the world looks exactly the same regardless of how I'm dressed. I guess it's like if you're in a police officer uniform and you go to work, people might treat you differently than if you're in, you know, grey sweatpants at the gym. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, But you're still the same person regardless of how you're dressed. And just like Kim Kardashian might spend three hours in hair and makeup to get ready for a party or a red carpet. That's kind of what Courtney's like for me. It's, it's, it's getting dressed up to go out and look glamorous and have fun and indulge in the performative nature of femininity and fashion and makeup and hairstyles. And um, I think with that comes a certain level of entitlement um, where people expect you or to act a certain way, or they treat you a different sort of way that gives you more access and more opportunity to be a little bit hyper and hyper real and hyper like with with energy and with fun and and people kind of you know when you're a drag queen in a in a room of um, civilians, if you will, um, people are like interested in that or when you're a glamorous woman in a in a space of people in normal I mean even if you're at an event quite often being in drag is is still heightened from other women on the red carpet right and so there's the element of difference that allows 
um, a bit more of a platform, I guess, to to talk or to hold court. Uh, and that's not to say that Shane and Courtney are different so much. It's more to say that when I'm Courtney, people treat me differently and therefore I might act different based on how they treat me. So it's kind of nuanced, I guess, but it's definitely something that I enjoy observing as well, how people, particularly, say, straight men, will treat me differently as Shane and as Courtney. And I get into some of those stories in the book about um, sexual relations with straight identifying guys. And even still, it fascinates me to observe either the, the hoops that some people will jump through, the denial that some people will employ, or perhaps just the personal boundaries of some people where they know what they do like and what they don't like. And a little bit of lipstick and a bit of a wig is the difference between loving and loathing. Thank you so much for your time today, Shane. We really appreciate you talking to us and uh, congratulations on, on Caught in the Act, uh, which you can Thank order right you. now at booktopia.com.au. And I'm about to go upstairs. I was, I was coming to you live from the, the boardroom upstairs before, but unfortunately the Wi-Fi wasn't strong enough. There's like 700 books that I'm about to go sign for Booktopia one by one. So um, oh, I know that if, if, if on Booktopia the uh, signed copy logo is still on it, there's still some signed copies left. So yep. um, yeah, get in and get them. But I'm, I'm sure they will go very fast. <laughs> I'm, I'm determined to, you know, beat Lisa Wilkinson from the... Uh, up the ladder although i'm sure that i won't because i did read some pages of her uh her book stuffed into the packing of the boxes of these books and i was like oh that's so juicy um there's lots of juicy <laughs> things in here too so i hope yeah. you enjoy reading it thanks so much for your time shane thanks have a good day Thanks to our guests, Fiona McIntosh and Shane Janik. You can find links to the books discussed today in our show notes or head over to booktopia.com.au. Stay tuned on Friday for our next episode, where we'll be discussing the books we're reading at the moment. And please join us for next week's interview show, where we'll be talking with Sophie Gonzalez, Carla Dietrich, and Karen McManus. As always, thanks for listening and never stop reading. <laughs>